Hey there, family. My name is Julian. I'm one of the pastors here at Every Nation Faith City. I'm so excited to be sharing the word with you today uh, with a special guest. Uh, but before we get to that, let's just get some of the formalities out of the way. So first off, would you please be so kind as to like, follow, subscribe on all our pages and our platforms. Uh, secondly, remember to share this video with someone uh, who might be encouraged by this. And then finally, we just want to thank you for your generosity and for giving uh, what God's laid on your heart to give today. Uh, your giving not only empowers us to reach our local communities, but to reach people all over the world with the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, so before we jump into the sermon, I introduce our special guest. Uh, I would just like to take a moment. Let's just pray and bless, uh, bless the offering today. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're good. Thank you that you're faithful. And thank you that we have been blessed to be a blessing to those around us. Lord, thank you that you, you lay on our hearts what we're supposed to, uh, to, to give, whether it's time, talent, energy, resources, um, and you help us to be faithful and obedient. We thank you that you are good and that you are our source and our provider in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are jumping into a new series called Overwhelmed But God. And at this time, you might be facing a situation that feels like there's no hope. You might be uh, in a situation that whether you caused it yourself or whether it's external factors, you feel overwhelmed. And the good news is that God is not done yet. God wants to come into your situation and redeem it for his glory. And in this series, we're going to be looking at specifically how God handled overwhelming problems and how people reacted to this in the right way. Um, now, it is my absolute pleasure and privilege to introduce to you guys Pastor Jürgen Skuman, all the way from Van der Beyl. <laughs> hey, Julian. Hey, guys. It's great to be here. Oh, my goodness. No, it's so good to have you as well. We're really excited uh, hmm. for today's word, even when we were prepping this message. Uh, yeah, there a lot of cool and exciting things came out. Yeah. But uh, before we jump in, Pastor Jürgen, would you pray for us? Sure. Heavenly Father, we just come and we... We thank you that we can spend this time in mm -hmm. your word and, and, and we really want an encounter with you. So Holy Spirit, we pray that you will come and that you will open up a word for us. I pray that each person that, that is watching this message will encounter you and will find something that, that really applies to them. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. So before we jump into the scripture, I want to start with a story, if that's okay with you. Sure. <laughs> yes. Okay. So this is the story of Edmund Carpenter. He was an anthropologist in the 1960s, and he went to Papua New Guinea uh, to a tribe called the Biami tribe. And these were people who had never seen a full reflection of themselves. They had no mirrors in this culture. They had no, uh, obviously no cameras. Uh, and what happened is they would only see themselves briefly reflected in a murky river. So this anthropologist who would go and study how people reacted to, 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 to change and how cultures and tribes interacted, then went and, and decided to bring a couple of Polaroid cameras with instant developing film to yeah. this tribe and what he would do is he would take pictures and then he would make a note of their reaction to seeing their first true picture of what they looked like for the first time ever in history well wow. and uh he was super excited about this so he took pictures and he's wondering okay are they going to be excited they're going to be nervous and this is what he writes down how people reacted to seeing themselves for the first time this is what he said he said they reacted by doubling over, by folding themselves in half, covering them, their faces. They responded with terror. They were embarrassed when they realized this is what they looked like. He also wrote, tribesmen reported alike to these experiences. They ducked their heads and covered their mouths. He reported they were paralyzed. After their first startled response, they stood transfixed, staring at their image. Only their stomach muscles betraying great tension. So to review, they ducked their heads, they covered their mouths, they tensed up their stomachs. They were cringing yeah. when they saw themselves. <laughs> now, the word cringing comes from the word kringen, which means uh, to die in battle. <laughs> <laughs> and it means to become crinkly or to become circularly shaped. And there is a reason why I'm sharing this, and I'll explain why later uh, and finish the story at the end of the sermon because you won't believe what they did after this but have you ever ignored advice and it, it kind of messed up your life <laughs> or uh or cringed over something you realize you did yeah i i have a whole high school 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I even, some of my cringes go back as far as last week, you know? So, <laughs> so sometimes I watch sermons and I'm like, oh my Lord, I shouldn't have done that with my face. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. And um, a lot of times, I, I don't know if you've been in a situation where you've given advice to people and you, they, oh, yes. <laughs> and they, they have not taken it mm. and you, and they cringed afterwards. Now, this is exactly what happens in the first half of the book of Ezekiel, where God warns them. He warns the people of Israel that they should change their reaction because they're going to regret it. It's going to be something that they're going to cringe at later. And uh, what, what happens is they, they miss out on so many things because of these experiences and the worst happens to them. Uh, but before I go further into that, um, Pastor Gerkens, would you mind giving us some background information on Ezekiel? Sure. All right. So Ezekiel was um, this Jewish guy, and he was actually in the line of priests. So he was on his way to become a priest. And then he finds himself in this position where he's forcefully removed with uh, many of other um um, most important people in the city. So the royalty and because it was in the priestly line, those guys were all um, exiled to Babylon. Mm. So he was on this track to become a priest. And then suddenly his whole world is basically taken away from him. It's like everything that he was living for is suddenly dead. His circumstances is dead. Um, so he finds himself in this position um, where he's completely interrupted. His life is interrupted. And then God comes and interrupts his life again. And God comes and he actually um, appoints Ezekiel as a prophet to the people um, around oh, wow. him. The Jews is now with him in exile and also to the Jews back home. So God um, uses him to warn the people that, um, guys, there are still worse things that will happen if you continue in the way that you are continuing. Uh, so God has him do like the craziest street performances i mean it, it had to draw attention but still yeah. people d just ignored god so then the worst happened exactly what was predicted happened to these guys uh, jerusalem was attacked and all the jews were yeah basically everybody was then also removed into babylon so every, yeah. suddenly the last glimmer of hope that you mm. would have that has also been now taken away from you. And they find themselves in this position where they are facing the consequences of their own actions. They find themselves completely without hope. Mm. And you would think that in this moment, the message that God would give them was one that says, I told you so. Yeah. That's kind of the message that I would probably want to give people <laughs> in that situation. Yeah. But... God and, and, and through Ezekiel doesn't do that. Mm. What God does when these guys find themselves in the situation of utter devastation, utter loss, it's, you know, it's like Trevor Noah when he, he talks about dead, dead, dead. That, that's kind of a situation they <laughs> yeah. find themselves in. And in this, God comes and he releases through Ezekiel a message of hope. That's so good. He comes and he says that now you are facing the consequences mm. of your actions. And I had to act because I was protecting my name. Remember, the, 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 the Israelites were called to, to reflect God, to be a represent, representation of God to the people around them. And they were doing a terrible job at it. So God had to act. But then also, God also says, for his name's sake, also he will restore the people. Yeah. He, will, um, he, will, he will glorify his name by, by, um, by restoring and reviving and, and, and basically resurrecting their lives again and giving them new hope. So I think this is, this is, this is kind of what we are going for, is, is God is in the resurrection business. That's good. Um, if, if, if you can read all through the scriptures, you will see that this is something that God does. God creates and then he recreates when it's necessary. So we're going to jump in at Ezekiel um, in, in, in the middle of this message of hope in, in chapter 37. And, and you can really, from um, this chapter or chapter 34 um, onwards, you can mm. read this whole, whole message. Um, um, I'm just going to read a, a, a portion of that um, in Ezekiel 37. But just to give you some context, um, this is the story of uh, the Valley of the Dry Bones. So mm. Ezekiel has this vision where he finds himself um, in a valley and there is 
a bunch of bones strewn all around him. Mm. But I mean a lot, like a multitude <laughs> of bones and human bones that are just lying everywhere. Yeah. And then God asks him this question. He asks him, um, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel gives a wise answer. He's like, um, I don't know, God, but you know. <laughs> it's kind of like, ah, uh, what do you think? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you have this moment, and then what happens is almost like a creation story all over yeah. again. Um, um, Ezekiel is still to prophesy over the bones, and he do that, and um, you see that the bones start coming together, and they form skeletons, and yeah. then the skeletons um, get covered with um, sinews and skin, and so you have bodies, and then lastly, uh, the breath, God's breath is breathed into them, mm. and they become uh, uh, living beings, and and suddenly these what was bones at first now becomes a great big army, mm. so. This is now where I want to kick off just with the part of scripture that I want to read. And this is from verse 11. It says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So God says that although all is lost, mm. I intend to resurrect your lives. I intend to change the situation. You are facing consequences, but I'm not going to leave you in those consequences. Mm. I want to give you a new hope. I want to give you a new purpose. That's what God wants to do. And, and as I said, God is in the resurrection business. He, he wants to resurrect things that are dead. When you look at Jesus' mm. ministry on earth, you see that he resurrected at least three people on his earthly ministry awesome. before he yeah. went through, through the cross. And then if you read uh, Revelations 1 verse 15, you see that Jesus himself is called... Um, the um, firstborn from the dead, wow. implying that, that those who follow him, those who are believers, will also be resurrected into life. So, so Ephesians 5 verse 14 hmm. says, for, if anything that becomes, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, hmm. and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. But I also want to just um, quickly go into uh, a story where Jesus resurrects um, people Peter's situation. So remember, um, after the crucifixion, uh, uh, or, or just before the crucifixion, Peter promised Jesus mm. that he will not deny him. Typically, Peter, you know, <laughs> he's like brave and he's like, no, I will never deny you. Mm. Only to a few hours later, deny Jesus three times. Mm. So this has happened and this is weighing down or weighing Peter down. Yeah. And, and then you get to this story after Jesus has been resurrected and he appears to the disciples. We find this in, um, in John chapter 21. It says, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these or more than these others do? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, mm -hmm. you know, I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Mm. Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He mm. said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. So we find in this situation that, that Jesus actually comes and he gives Peter a chance to repent. Mm. And it's almost like an undo button. Um, Peter denied Jesus three times. Three times Peter gets an opportunity mm. to repent. Um, but this is the amazing part. After every time that Peter repents, Jesus um, gives Peter an instruction. Um, he tells him to feed the sheep or feed the lamb or look after the sheep. And, and basically what Jesus is doing is he is pointing Peter back into his God-given mm -hmm. purpose. And Peter takes hold of that God-given purpose and he becomes yeah. one of the main leaders in the church, in the early church. Um, Peter himself raises people from the dead um, and uh, he follows Jesus for the rest of his life and it makes a huge impact. He leaves a legacy. 
um, because of, yeah. of, of of Jesus resurrecting his life and his situation again. And you know what I really like about this, and you see this with Peter, and you see this with the people of Israel in the book of Ezekiel. You see that they messed up. You see they felt ashamed. Mm. I can't imagine how Peter would feel having denied Jesus three times. The disciples know about it. He did it publicly. Mm. Uh, and on top of that, now Jesus is back and he's alive. And he sees Jesus again. And it's kind of an awkward interaction, at least from Peter's perspective. And the same thing happens with, in the book of Ezekiel, we have the people who've been warned. They know, they've seen this outlandish prophet who's done all these street performances, like you put it, uh, just to get people's attention. And they didn't listen. And the temple was destroyed. And now they feel like that was the only way we could contact God. Mm. If God's going to speak to us, he's going to tell us, um, I told you so. Or this, like, finally you got what you deserved. And yet what we see is that even when they messed up and they felt ashamed, God had a plan to redeem them. Mm. And what we see is that, and I think a lot of times we believe this lie that after we mess up, after we sin, that God writes us off, that he doesn't want a relationship with us Mm. anymore. We've broken the terms of the relationship. And even if God did want to speak to us, it's probably going to be something condemning or probably I told you so or... I got you, you know, yeah. and, <laughs> and that's not his heart. Cause what we see is that God doesn't just have a plan for prevention. He has a plan for redemption. We feel like God's sometimes we feel like God only has a plan to prevent sin from happening in the first place. That his only solution is don't do it. But the truth is the following that God doesn't just have a plan for prevention. He has a plan for redemption. His plan for redemption isn't just to fix what's broken but to make it better than it ever was before. And what you see in, uh, so so Pastor Jürgens read from um, Ezekiel 37, but before that in Ezekiel 34, this is the first thing that God tells his people when he speaks to them again. He talks to them about sending a new shepherd, Mm -hmm. saying that, look, you've had shepherds and they haven't been good shepherds. Shepherds who didn't protect the sheep, who ate the sheep, and you had wild animals come in and the shepherds would run away. And it's this whole messed up situation. But this is what happens. This is what God tells the people in Ezekiel 34, verse 23 to 24. He says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. And at the end of the chapter, God says, I will be their shepherd. They are my sheep. And this is one of the first prophetic words that we see about Jesus. And this is one of the words where it talks about God redeeming the people of Israel. So this is where he talks about a new king. And in chapter 37, it talks about a new birth, Mm -hmm. not just for one person, but for the entire nation. It's a multitude of people receiving rebirth. And a lot of times, We believe in God's creation and we believe in birth, but we don't believe in rebirth. And what we see here in uh, in Genesis 3, there's a different story. You see Adam and Eve after they messed up and after they broke God's plan, if you will. And what you see is that they realized they were naked after they sinned for the first time and they were ashamed. They hid from God. That was their response to this to hide what he saw the entire time. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous to try to hide from God. He's like, where are you? Are you in the box? You can't see me. Yeah. (laughs) If I can't see you, you can't see me. (laughs) And God responds. He talks to them about like, well, how do you know you're naked? Like, did you eat from the tree? And then they go, oh, it wasn't me. It was the woman and then the snake. And then it was, it's a mess. It's a mess, God. It's a mess. Mm -hmm. But what happens is he shows them a picture of what they actually look like spiritually. He clothed them. He made them a promise. And instead of gloating about it, he had a plan for redemption. Mm. God doesn't just have a plan for preventing sin, for prevention. God has a plan for redemption. And here's the thing, though. Sometimes after God's redeemed something, or when we hear this, we feel like we can never be restored But total redemption, God wants total redemption, which is more than just fixing something that's been broken. Part of the redemption plan is making it better than we had it before. And we see this throughout scripture of God redeeming time and time and time and time and time again. In fact, in John 16, this is right before, this is right when Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, I'm going to be crucified. And uh, it's not going to be the end. 
So he's speaking to Peter here. He's speaking to his disciples. And in John 16, verse 5 to 13, from verse 5, he says, But now I'm going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I'm going. (laughs) Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. There's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit comes, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. And it actually goes on and it says that the Holy Spirit is one with the Father and he's one with me. We're mm. at this, we're on the same page when it comes to this. Mm. We're not operating three separate agendas. It's not the Holy Spirit's coming to advocate and Jesus is up, but Jesus is still upset at us, or God the Father <laughs> is still upset at us. They're on the same page. And when the Holy Spirit came, what you'll notice is it wasn't primarily to reveal our sin, to show us the full picture. Uh, It was to show us the full picture of what we actually look like. It wasn't to condemn. It was to redeem. It wasn't just to make us cringe, if you will, but to guide us in all truth. And all truth includes the truth of redemption and God's plan for redemption. So good. So the Holy Spirit came as an advocate. He didn't come as an accuser. He shows us the full truth, the truth that we've sinned, the truth that he's fighting with us and that he wants us restored. Now, I want to want to close this out today, but um, before I do, do you want to hear the conclusion? To yeah, the, yes. that was okay. a cringe story. So, so the story from the beginning of these people who had seen pictures of themselves for the first time, it doesn't end with them just cringing over what they look like. What happens is they they took these pictures and they changed their appearance. They asked, "Hey, can we keep a mirror? Can we keep a camera? Because we want to work on our appearance. We want to change this." And what they did is the way they responded to this is I'm not going to live like this. They saw the full picture of what they actually look like. Mm. And they were like, this isn't who I want to be. This isn't who I can be. I can be better than this. And what you see is their response is so different, if you will, from Adam and Eve's response Mm. to seeing a picture of their nakedness, of seeing a picture of what they actually look like. When they saw the full picture of what they look like, they withdrew. They withdrew from community. They withdrew from God. They started blame shifting. And what you see with this tribe is they, they, they felt the terror, the, the feeling of, I don't like looking like this. I don't like being like this. Mm. And they started pursuing community. They started pursuing um, a better thing. They, they, they worked on some of the things, but they, they kept pursuing a clearer and a better picture mm. and working towards something like that. So now that you see the results, the fully fleshed out picture of what we look like. When we see the effect of our sin, when we see, oh my gosh, I'm actually guilty of all this. We realize that the Holy Spirit didn't just come to fight us. He didn't come to fight us, but he came to fight with us like an Mm -hmm. advocate in a court case who helps us to not only understand the accusation against us, to, to understand the sin, but the consequence uh, and the consequence, but he leads us into the whole truth, which includes God's plan for redemption. That is, that is so God. (laughs) So let's not isolate and withdraw from God when this truth is revealed to us. Yeah. I think that's, that's kind of what we, uh, our natural tendency is to isolate and, and, uh, first from God, like Adam and Eve, mm-hmm. um, we, we, do, we feel the shame and we feel we, we don't have access to God because of the circumstances we find ourselves in, whether we mm-hmm. caused it or we just find ourselves there. Um, but we also tend to, to, to turn away from community and, and, and go and hide. And guys, we've, we've had enough self-isolation already. <laughs> um, there are ways for us to connect. And I think it's important for us to connect, especially especially if you feel in a position where you, mm. you feel shame, where you feel like, oh, this picture that I'm looking at isn't great. God wants to restore that picture. So maybe in your life right now, you're in a situation where 
um, you feel like there's some dead situations around you. Um, maybe you're looking at your finances and you're thinking, God, this is a dead situation. This looks like dry bones. Or um, maybe it's your academics and you don't know how you're going to complete your degree or you want to restore a relationship or you're trusting for a spouse or something like that and it just feels dead. God is in the resurrection business. Mm. He wants to restore you. So um, I, I think that's what we need to know is, is, is we, can, we can go towards God. We can go mm. towards a good spiritual community and, and they will help us in this journey. Yeah. So if it's okay, I want to I pray us out. And, and I, I really want to pray for, for two groups of people. First of, if you've, you're experiencing one of those dead situations in your life, I want to pray mm. that God's light will come in, that he will give you a word even um, about that situation that will change it and, and yeah. turn it around. That's and good. then if you if you realize that you're actually like one of those dead, dead dry bones and, and, and you're not going to follow Jesus in the resurrection because you're not following now, I want to give you that opportunity um, to, uh, to accept Jesus, to make him your king, and then he becomes your savior as well. And, um, and, 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 and just give you an opportunity to follow him into this resurrection life where he has meant for you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come and we thank you for, for restoring us, for, for, for having a plan that is, is, is so much better than we could even have imagined. God, we, we don't need somebody to, to, tell, to tell us, I told you so. We know about our own mistakes. We cringe at our own lives so many times. But we thank you for restoring and renewing our lives. Thank you, God, for wanting to resurrect dead things. So, Father, I come right now and I pray for every person who is experiencing some kind of dead situation around them. God, I come and I pray that you will breathe life into that situation, that you will come and that you will redeem that situation. Father, I pray that um, you will provide in what way is needed. Mm. I pray that you will release new hope into everybody's heart who's watching this video now. And I also come and I pray for people who is in a situation where they realize that my life is dead, my, I'm, I'm wasting my life and wants to turn to you. Father, I pray that right now they will <laughs> realize it's as easy as accepting Jesus um, or just accepting Jesus as King. So we come and we do that now. We, we recognize you as King Jesus. And, and I pray, God, that um, they will experience your, your life just flowing into them. Um, your new hope flowing into them right now. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so if this is you, if, if you have made a decision to follow Jesus, um, as we said, community is important. Mm. Please contact us. Please connect with us yeah. on the platform that you're using right now. Just send us a message. Um, or if it's a message that you have received somehow, um, just follow the links back to us. We really want to connect with you and help you to follow Jesus well. Um, that's what family is for and that is what our purpose is. So we're praying that you will, um, yeah, that, that new hope will be released and you, that you will be able to walk in this resurrection life. Awesome. Pastor Jurgens, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, um, it's been so great. I really, I really enjoyed today's message and I just want to encourage you guys once again, uh, reach out to us. Uh, we want to we wanna come alongside you and uh, step on this journey with you uh, with discovering the full picture of who God made you to be. Yeah. And uh, if you only remember one thing, remember that and be encouraged that God doesn't just have a plan for preventing bad things from happening, but for redeeming what the enemy meant for evil. Mm -hmm. So bless you. I hope you have a fantastic day and until next time.